cool. Glad to be together, be with you today. Good, Reverend Al, root beer. I read that as beer and I was like, you're coming out strong, Reverend Al. <laughs> Alrighty, getting started. Great to be with you all today. All right, so let's see who else we have here. Ice tea, ice tea is great. A couple more folks coming in. All right, well, we are getting started today and it is uh, good to be with you all. Uh, my name is Reverend Katie Sexton Wood. I serve as executive director of the Arizona Faith Network. Um, and today we are talking about the thing we probably are all already dreading, which is the heat season. Um, we have been involved in the work of cooling centers and extreme heat. Now this is our fourth year. I think it's our third year running cooling centers, fourth year being involved with the network. Um, and we have lots to tell you. So our format for this lunch and learn, please feel free to eat whatever you need. If you need to turn your camera off to, to eat or you're welcome to eat on the camera too. Make sure you're nourishing yourself with some, some good food and good uh, water today as we talk about this heat and the importance of hydration. We're gonna start as soon as some folks slow down and join in with a quick video that we recorded last heat season on the work that AFN is involved in. Sandy, love your t-shirt, go Suns. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, good, good choice there. Um, so we're gonna start with a quick video, just laying out the framework of AFN's work. Uh, Vasi, while I'm sharing a screen, I'm gonna ask you to let folks in because it's, it pops up that ugly gray thing if, if I try to do it too on here. Um, and then we will turn it, the reins over to the amazing Dr. Melissa Guadaro, um, who will be giving us more information on heat this summer so let me see if i can get this going for us if you're just joining us we invite you to drop your name and organization in the chat and what you like to drink on a warm day let me share one more time and it should be off to the race Summer 2020 marked the hottest summer on record for Arizona. Right smack dab in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were dealing with the loss of life due to the coronavirus. And we were also dealing with extreme heat that was killing so many vulnerable people in our communities. In Arizona, we were down from over almost 100 cooling centers down down to less than a dozen here in Maricopa County. 2020 is when Arizona Faith Network got the call from the Heat Relief Network to see if we could in some way, form or fashion, participate in serving as a cooling center. Arizona Faith Network through uh, a cooperation of a coalition of different nonprofits, different partnerships, including with the Heat Relief Network was able to work with upwards of 10 different faith communities providing heat relief and heat respite throughout the heat season. Part of what it means to be a church in the downtown is that you will have um, people on your doorstep in need. And we are then really called, I think, as a church and as Christians to respond to what those needs are. I don't know if you've ever stepped out in the Phoenix heat in 115 degrees, 117. You can't sit anywhere. So as a church, we have this beautiful big hall. We have the opportunity to air condition it and we can invite people to come inside of our doors, inside the building and be the church. When I've sat down to invite faith communities into this work, sometimes there's a hesitation um, because the need is so great. We are experiencing an affordable housing crisis like we have never seen in Arizona. We have so many people that are experiencing homelessness due to the eviction crisis and the rising cost of living. But 
I always like to reassure these faith communities that one, they're not alone, and two, we are not trying to solve everything in one day or even through this program. We are just trying to provide help, a hand, some grace, and some dignity in connection to resources. Majority of the people are unsheltered and they've had to go to the hospital. They have, um, they've been dehydrated. Uh, some people come in that have medical conditions compounded on top of the heat. So we've assisted in that. As a team, we've helped people get housing. We've helped people who have been in domestic abuses. We've helped uh, one gentleman was saved. His life was saved because he had uh, diabetes. And with diabetes, you have to check your extremities every day, especially your feet but he was um, caught just in enough time to actually save his life, even though he lost uh, part of his extremity. Our assistant that found him was feeling bad because he lost that extremity, and I had to explain to him, you actually saved his life. I, I have a vivid memory of someone, you know, in a tent, and he had overdosed plus heat stroke, and that was terrifying, and that's not an uncommon sight out here on the streets. So that was a really big reason for me. It was like, uh, we, we got to, come together as a community and do something. You know, we, we really gotta mobilize. And here in Arizona, the need is so incredibly fast. You know, it's hard. it was hard for me this summer with the cooling van because there's so many locations simultaneously that all, you know, had camps of people who maybe couldn't make it to a cooling center at this time. And it was hard for me to, to be able to, to hit all these spots. And I think that, you know, one thing that would be really wonderful next summer is um, trying to replicate that model, have 10 cooling vans, 20, 30, just different groups, you know, all going out there and hitting different spots. And I think that's really the key to, you know, being there for our community in the best possible way. We as a faith community are called to respond, to help and to serve our neighbors that are in need. We have space where we can open our doors, where we can invite our neighbors. We have those trusted relationships that are already established in neighborhoods. And two, we have a moral and we have a spiritual mandate to love those that are in need. I think one thing that's been beautiful about this program is watching the different people throughout Arizona come together to help serve our vulnerable communities. It's just rewarding me. I just like help people. I just can't stop saying I like help people. Just to go home and just feel good you did something for somebody else, oh, that's awesome. I think the most rewarding part is just helping those people who come that seem to need so much. They're not very clean and they're very tired and they're hungry and these are the things that I'm helping them with and I just get a joy out of helping them. Our summers are getting hotter, our heat season is getting longer and our neighbors are increasingly suffering from many, many socioeconomic issues. If you are interested in getting engaged in the Cooling Center Response Program work, you're invited. Just talk to our staff, sign up on ArizonaFaithNetwork.org. There is always a place for you. Just like we tell any of our Cooling Center guests, you belong here and you are loved. And so we hope you will come, engage, help, and serve so we can continue to make Arizona stronger together. Well, I hope that uh, worked. My internet started to be a little slow there for a minute. Um, let me see if I can turn my video off real quick. Um, and. That was our brief video we did last year. We are going to expand upon the documentary of the work our faith communities have been involved in over the years. Um, but for now, let us look at the data from the last couple of years from our data and extreme heat guru, Dr. Guadaro. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, and then I'm going to, I'll just gave you a preview of the whole thing, I guess. Here we go. <clears throat> can everybody see it? Yes, we can see yours. Perfect. Okay. So I don't need to tell you that it's hot out. And even though this past winter and spring has been mild, 
Um, we have learned through the Arizona Heat Resilience Working Group from Paul and Ingwes from the National Weather Service that that has no bearing whatsoever on the heat season that's coming up. And for those of you that think that you know, it seems like it's getting hotter here. You're absolutely right. And uh, you can go to these charts. This one that I'm showing right now is for the city of Phoenix. And this is the maximum temperature by month for roughly 120 years. And you can see that slow increase. And that is due to climate change. But here are the evening temperatures. And this is what is really particularly dangerous for human health. <clears throat> And this is the minimum temperatures. And you can see how the minimum temperatures are drastically increasing. And once you get above 85, 88 degrees, it really has an impact on human health. So heat is here for two different reasons. One has to do with that background, that first chart that I showed that's due to climate change. And the other one is due to the urban heat island effect. And this is the idea that the materials that a city is made of and the way that the buildings are positioned really help to trap the heat. So at night, the heat isn't released. So you can see on the far left and the far right of this chart, both the desert and farmland agriculture, it actually gets very cool at night. Uh, it gets very hot during the day, but it gets very cool at night. But there's that smaller difference in the urban core. So in the number of 100 degree days, and I know for people in Phoenix, you know, 100, 105, it's a dry heat, it's not that bad, but the number of 100 degree days um, has been increasing. And you can see that red dot is uh, representing 2020. And that was a, a really super hot year. That was the first year of COVID. And you can see that the, the weather that we had in 2020 is really what we're predicting for about 2050. So that would be an everyday summer. And then more dangerously, the 110 degree days, you can see that that's also what the future will be like. So here's a chart of where we were last year. Um, the big red line is 2022, that's last year. And we're running about average for the number of 100 degree plus days. And the same is also true for 110 degree days. And that thin red line on the top is where we were in 2020. And you can see just how increasingly hot it was that year. There were 18 heat warning days in uh, 2022. And those happened very quickly in the middle of June. And these were the days that a heat warning was issued. But I want you to also understand that for the two or three days beforehand and the two or three days afterwards, the temperatures were just one degree off. So we were just shy of what that heat warning day criteria were. So we had just about two weeks of increasingly hot weather. And it really wasn't probably gonna be like this summer where it really wasn't bad in April and May, and then it came on very strong. And because of that, uh, we had a lot of heat associated deaths. There was a lag time from those two weeks or so when it was so hot and where the concentration of deaths were. And there were, uh, I think 40% of the deaths, uh, excuse me, 60% of the deaths that happened happened in, during that first heat wave period. And you see it also mirroring uh, hospital visits too. Although people went to the hospital for heat exhaustion and heat stroke um, very early in May, but you can also see how during that June period, those were just building as well. The majority of the deaths have occurred outside. And since 2020, that's an interesting statistic because we had a moratorium on evictions. You were not going to get evicted during COVID. And we also had a moratorium on utility disconnections. The moratorium on evictions has lifted, but disconnections stay in place during the extreme heat weather. So statewide, oops, this is an old slide, but statewide we are up to 675 deaths. So you can see that this is increasing over and over again. And the most vulnerable populations are male, elderly, people living alone that don't have a built-in support network, people with pre-existing health conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and also children because they're young, they don't have the thermoregulators in just yet, people with low socioeconomic status and substance abusers. We had a lot of the deaths last year that also had substance abuse issues. 
But these are communities that are also impacted by heat. Um, we heard from the video about the unhoused people, but then those also living on limited or fixed incomes, like the elderly, that even though their air conditioning bills increase during the summer, they don't get an extra bump in social security. People who have inefficient cooling systems and people who are concerned about high utility bills and may have working air conditioning, but do not want to turn on their cooling. There are all sorts of tips about staying safe in the heat, and this is from Maricopa County Public Health. This next chart shows the difference between heat, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat stroke is a serious illness. You, if you see somebody exhibiting these symptoms, you need to call 911 immediately, whereas heat exhaustion, if you move the person to a cooler space and give them water and uh, cold compresses, you should see recovery. So we heard a lot about cooling centers and I'm gonna get into the different definitions of different types of cooling centers, but generally speaking, a cooling center is an air conditioned indoor public space. And these can be informal like libraries and community centers, but they also formal ones. And these can be city, city launched community centers and um, also not-for-profits not and faith-based campuses as well. So we have agreements for operating a cooling center that it needs to be open to all who have the need and not discriminate based upon age, race, religion, gender identity, or familial status. That you need to follow CDC guidelines for operating the cooling center during the COVID pandemic. And those are just good rules for safety and health now as well. And that you're ideally open continuously from May through September. And this is where we differ from a lot of other regions where a lot of other regions only stand up cooling centers during those heat warning days and to really consider being pet friendly. So we have come to agreement on different types of cooling and hydration stations. And a hydration station is a location that could be indoors or outdoors that offers drinking water. A cooling center, as I said before, is an indoor air conditioned location that offers hydration. And we have a respite center, and this is where the Arizona Faith Network um, the cooling places really differ from most others and that a lot of them are respite centers and these are indoor air conditioned locations that not only offer hydration but also allows for rest. Now that can be sitting down and taking a nap or lying down depending upon the location. And then our best case scenario, we would like to see cooling shelters and these are cooling centers that are designed for overnight stays. So there's really an urgent need to continue to expand the network of cooling centers. And in 2019, we were at 106. In 2020, uh, we were really in a desperate situation in that only 19 opened and AFN really stepped up to uh, help with that. And um, last year we were averaging 90 to 95 cooling centers. So this is my contact information and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. We are um, going to quickly go through AFN's kind of framework really quick, and then we're going to open up to just a broader question and answer session. So if you have any questions that you want to get out of your brain right now for Melissa, please drop them in the chat and we will um, round back to them at the end. Um, so thank you, Melissa. It's always good to have the scientific viewpoint and I always joke that uh, between Gretchen and Melissa this is how we got here um, and we've done some amazing work together so just really quick to go over the work that AFN is in. So as Melissa said um, in partnership with Arizona State University local nonprofits uh, our faith-based organization partners in the Maricopa uh, County Heat Relief Network, we have been opening up faith-based cooling centers throughout Maricopa over the last few years. Um, these are strategically placed. So we work with our scientists like Dr. Guadaro and others uh, to make sure that we are placing our heat relief centers in strategically heat vulnerable popula populated areas um, and that we're not opening centers right on top of each other. So we're, we're trying to work with our communities um, that are a willing to be a heat relief location um, and also in an area 
where the heat and the urban heat um, is higher um, and perhaps the population is a little bit more at risk. So as uh, Dr. Guadara also said that we open these centers throughout the heat season for the amount of hours that work at each particular congregational site or house of worship site, um, not just during the extreme, extreme heat warning days. Um, it is helpful to have additional sites open during the extreme heat warning days, but it is really, really dangerous in the months of June and July and August um, when those evening hours are really high because folks that are especially um, using our centers often are people experiencing homelessness or perhaps have an air conditioner that's broken at home um, or do not have access for some reason to a cool space. And so they're not able to sleep. Um, and so most of the time, I think Irene and I quoted at about like 80 to 90% of the time people are using our heat respite centers. They are really actually just coming in and sleeping. Um, they'll bring their pets in with them. They'll get water, they'll get some food, um, they'll get some hygiene resources and lay down and sleep. Um, to know that they have a safe place to be in for a few hours. The role that AFN plays in all of this is we operate as a network. Um, Irene Arashtan is our resilience um, and heat relief manager for AFN. And so we are that bridge between the nonprofits, the cities, the county, the state, the faith-based institutions to try to help equip all our houses of worship with the staff that they may need to run the center, the training that is needed, the supplies, everything from water to um, naloxone and Narcan to be trained on that in case of substance use. Um, we train on how to recognize a heat emergency, what to do in each situation and who to call. Um, so we are that bridging agent between all of these resources and houses of worship and neighborhoods to ensure that resources are directed to locations that are um, needing them the most and um, are often the most heat vulnerable. So with that, um, as you saw in our video, we have uh, um, a calling in our different faith traditions to serve our neighbors and to help our neighbors. And we also, in pretty much every faith tradition, have some space, some community gathering space. And so faith-based institutions are uniquely positioned to host um, heat relief respite centers um, because one, we have space. The, we're located in neighborhoods. Um, you could probably drive down any block and find a house of worship within uh, most of Arizona. We're already established within the community, so most of our houses of worship know our neighbors, they know the neighborhood, they know what resources are there, they have those trusted relationships, um, both with their neighbors and other nonprofits and officials. We have that moral and theological mandate to help those that are vulnerable. And we really are at that community level. I cannot emphasize enough the importance that we play in this heat relief role because we have to be in relationship with the people that we are working with um, in order to really get that change to break that cycle of poverty, a cycle of homelessness, the cycle of addiction. And so there has to be that trust there. And that's where houses of worship just come in and make a huge difference. Each year we uh, fundraise to do a one-to-one -one donation. Um, this year, I'm happy to say that my husband and I are going to be matching up to $2,000. And so we encourage you to make a donation um, and double that impact for us to help get more supplies out to these sites. Um, and you can do that through our website. We'll show you our website in just a few moments. Um, but all of this work started um, from you all, from our communities that stepped up and said they wanted to do something. And so um, we started with a donation from the Quaker faith tradition and they challenged us and said, hey, if you can match this, let's do some heat relief this summer. And a couple of years later, we're gonna be up to, I think the last um, count on there was about 13 sites 
this summer, um, providing heat respite relief throughout Maricopa County. Um, so that's a little bit about what AFN does. I do wanna draw your attention to, to our website, which has more up-to-date information. We're always trying to provide on there, including if your faith community is interested in being a heat relief site. Um, you have the option of donating funds, donating supplies, volunteering, or applying to be a heat relief site. Um, this is a very quick presentation we put together just for you to um, help explain what the program is, um, as well as the video we opened with is on our site as well. You can navigate to this by going to arizonafaithnetwork.org and go to our work and heat relief slash cooling centers. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and open it up to questions. And also, Irene, if you want to jump in and cover anything I might've missed or uh, Melissa might've missed. I think you guys covered it pretty well, but I would like to thank everybody on here. I see some of the people who have volunteered their time at the centers. We appreciate you so much. We cannot do it without you. So I would like to extend that appreciation. And these centers, as I started when I first came down there, I was just like amazed at the reception that the community have of us being there and coming from a faith-based background. It's just, it makes them see that someone is on their side. And as we service them in love, they are very much appreciative. And just like Reverend Katie said, the centers that have been opening the doors where they can come in and lay down for four or five hours a day helps a lot. One lady shared with me last year that she had been walking for about 17 hours straight. And I was just like, wow. So when they come into the centers, our uh, people who man the center are trained staff allow them to come in there and service them. That's the example that I set when I go down there in the centers that we serving, we're there to serve them because they're out there in the street and they need that compassion. And it just helps. They're very receptive to that and appreciative of it. And that's what I just want everybody to know. It's something positive we're doing. We're, we're saving lives and that's not anything I'm doing or saying that's really big, but I really believe we're saving lives and making a large impact. So again, I would like to thank everyone that is supportive of the cooling centers and participation in them. It's um, a great thing for you to go back to your church. If you have influence on your board members, go back to your church and try to get your church to be involved in this because we can't do it without you. Thanks, Irene. I dropped, um, or I'm gonna drop in the chat in just a second, the preliminary data that the Arizona Department of Health Services released yesterday on um, the 2022 heat-related mortality um, summary. I think it's really important to show this data knowing again that this is preliminary. They're still finishing up all the reports. Um, but 671 heat-related deaths, as Dr. Guadaro said, um, and it's not always the folks you think when you're thinking of heat-related deaths, um, but I, one statistic I think is really, in, well, a couple, these are all important, but 79% um, of the deaths were male, um, and the bulk of services that I'm seeing come out lately are for um, seniors and families. And I, I wanna point out that the faith communities have a way of always stepping up to serve the people that are forgotten and don't have a place to go. And so um, that often in terms of the heat relief work um, is single males um, or just single adults in general and or unmarried partners um, or people with pets. Those are usually the folks that we'll see that don't have anywhere else to go because if they're going into shelters, they may be separated from their partner. They often can't bring in their pet um, to get heat relief into a lot of spaces. And so um, it's really important when we're thinking about serving our communities to serve the whole community and to not put restrictions 
around particular populations, um, but at the same time also recognizing we have to make it safe for everyone. So there, there, there are things we work through with different churches and, and communities. Um, but I also want to quickly share the graph that was shared yesterday in the state um, heat meeting, which we will definitely share a link out to um, the recording from yesterday once it's released. But if you see this graph, you'll see that from 2010 to 2022, that is a significant increase in deaths. And um, while we definitely want to extend heat relief across the state, the other data that's shared is that 62% of the deaths are happening in Maricopa County. And so our efforts have been focused in Maricopa as a starting ground, um, one, our funding sources have been tried here as well. There are restrictions on where we can use um, a lot of the funding sources, um, but I did wanna show the data that had to do with regional areas as well. All right, let's open it up to questions. Oh yes, thank you. Um, We're so excited to have um, on here with us Rishandra Carnes from uh, APS, who's been a longtime partner with AFN. Um, she is involved in the Heat Relief Network um, and used to be with Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church, where we did great work together too. So Rishandra, hi. If you want to say anything about APS's work, please, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay? Or you can't hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I had some audio issues the other day. Now, thank you so much. Just glad to be um, a part of um, the solution. APS is a huge supporter of Heat Relief Network and just trying to uh, assist where we can and help out to um, our most vulnerable populations. We have partnerships with Salvation Army and also uh, the Solaris Network and just want to continue to be at the table to make sure that um, our impact is felt. So thank you very much. And thanks so much for providing the information and data today. Always very informative and just looking forward to reducing those numbers. Yes, yes, thank you. Glad to have you on here. Um, our utility partners are really key in all of this work to make sure that we are cross communicating and people have access to uh, the air conditioning and power that they need as we do this work. I see a question in the chat from Sherry. How many more uh, cooling and respite centers do you need in the metro area? Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Guadara, that's a hard question to answer, right? Because, uh, well, what do we, you think? we need strategically located cooling centers. I think that that's perhaps the most important thing because right now, um, a lot of the cooling centers that have been stood up are stood up based upon their volunteerism, right? So if you're a library, you are opening your doors, but there's plenty of need, in, especially in older inner city communities. So we have an optimization map that um, Reverend Katie could go into great detail about it, but we need at least 10 more. Yes, and um, we'll have, honestly, I, I, as of May 1st, I'll probably have a very specific answer for you compared to today. Um, because the dream would be that we have centers open every couple of miles for folks to use. So when we say how many more do we need, probably thousands and thousands, but we're doing as much as we can. Where we get stuck from the faith networks is always funding and resources and people and communities that will agree to open up their space um, to allow folks to come in. And so we open up as many as we possibly can. Um, I do know that one area that I'm anticipating once Maricopa Association of Governments opens up their heat relief network map this year, I think we're gonna see um, a huge gap in Maryville. Um, we used to have a church down there that opened, but we have not heard from them that they are gonna be opening this summer. Um, and so we are hoping to be working with some folks in Maryville to, to look in that particular area. So Sherry, that was absolutely not an answer, <laughs> but you know, anywhere from 10 to 10,000, there we go. But we'll do as much as we possibly can. Yes, Kate, uh, Reverend Kate. So you're seeing many more unhoused um, people up in Northwest Glendale on Bell Road. Do we have a partner up there? 
So um, the Northwest area, we've actually been working, Arizona Faith Network has been working with um, the city of Glendale to try to find a, a faith-based location within Glendale service and city limits to open in the Northwest Valley. Um, it's really difficult to find a church or a space up there along that green, uh, green um, area. So we would love if you have any ideas up in the Northwest area of Glendale, we do have some funding and resources tied to that area that we can help with. But we have not been able, we've asked, oh my gosh, Irene, maybe like five to seven different churches um, to, to open up there. And we, we haven't been successful in, in that yet. Um, so if you have any connections, please reach out to Irene or myself. Irene, do you want to take the next question in the chat? Okay. Oh, yes, the uh, 211 system will be transporting people. Um, in the city of Glendale, we have uh, actually have a transport system that will be taking people to and from the campgrounds to the center, but we still have the 211 system and we just still have to meet the qualifications to let them know that you are coming to one of the heat relief centers. Because if you do not let them know that, then they'll assume that you're just calling for a ride. So we do have to, like we did last year, make sure the people who call say they are going for heat relief. Yep. That has been a great program supported by APS with a 2-on-1 and Solari is there are free lift rides to heat relief cooling centers throughout the summer. If, if you or know of someone that needs transportation within the city of Glendale, like Irene said, Phoenix Rescue Mission will be providing free transportation throughout the summer within the city limits of Glendale. Um, do the, I'm gonna kick this one to, to Melissa. Do the, this is a great question. Do the utility companies provide heat relief maps in their monthly bills? Well, considering we have a utility person here, she should probably answer that. But, you know, even if they do, um, we should really be pressing the Heat Relief Network website because that map will be current and the map changes continuously. So um, if you Google MAG, M-A-G, Heat Relief Network, after May 1st, you should be able to get a map. Yeah, and just to add on to what Melissa was saying, we currently do not but we do have that link readily available to our, our, our customer service reps if anyone does call in and it's provided as a resource, but because the, it's ever changing. Um, but I definitely can look into uh, the, the matter a little bit more as far as maybe having the link readily available onto the bill. Great question, Sherry. These are, these are the things that are helpful make us think a little bit different. Um, Basu, Shiro Basu. Thank you, Reverend Katie. Just to mention the beauty of that, even that each religion and faith community is able to work independently and separately from others, we are taking the decision to work together and to deeply understand that through interfaith, we can build resilience in Arizona. So my appreciation for that and thinking that we have this great opportunity to collaborate with people who are diverse, from diverse religions, that diverse expressions and identities. And that just to mention, thank you. And then Sherry, I don't wanna, um, I see where you had a question in there earlier about um, how many centers do we need? as many as possible and each church that or facility that participates they can participate on any one of those four levels whether they be a cooling station but we prefer that they allow people to come in and lay down because that's what the need of the community is and then also i see where you said how computer literate are the people you serve most of the people have come in there and they've had the cell phone so if I just go on average, most of them are computer literate, but that's what the centers are doing. Also, we have people there that will also sit down with them. Most of the times people will also help them because we're just human. If somebody say, I need to learn how to do this, it's just human nature. We're gonna help them, even though we're there to basically give them the heat relief. 
but most of the people do have their phones and um, they'll scan the code in. And that's what we uh, had a discussion in the meeting as far as having the barcodes to the different centers that they can scan in their phone. Sandy. Um, I've been a, a volunteer for a while at one of the centers and it's been such a learning experience. I just want to comment that those here in, in this group on the Zoom uh, are more in the position of like recruiting people to be volunteers. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things that I think that is an image to put forth to them is that you can give people dignity for those few hours. And that I learned to be pretty much silent with some of the people who would come in. They, you know, they were, you have to start to think of them as hot, tired, whole people. And some are just so glad to, to talk with you and they, they, you let them lead, you know, they want to extend themselves and some can't. And it's, it, it's just amazing to me that with how little it seems like we're doing at times, how much most of the people who come in appreciate it. So that's just a little snippet from, I guess, what I've learned from being there. Thank you, Sandy. And I cannot say enough about volunteers, even if it's just a day here, a day there, we can use you, trust me. Um, and definitely makes a huge life-saving difference during the heat. So thank you, Sandy, for all your time. Sherry, I see your hand. Well, I'm, I got tired of typing in the chat box. So, my question is, I think the network is doing such an excellent job of coordinating resources, but if I'm hot um, and in need of some relief, I'm not necessarily thinking well. I'm not necessarily cognitively organized. And I may be far removed from the link to you. I may not know there's relief five blocks away. That's why my query about how did the people who are isolated in their non-air conditioned or not working air conditioning homes or people on the seeking shelter on the streets and struggling because they have pets or partners or whatever situation further removes them from access. Um, how do they know where the help is? And that's why I wondered, you know, it'd be great if I were at home and I got a notice in my bill to, to at least know that option is there, but um, but other people who don't get bills, I'm just wondering what what are your means of moving the word to the people, or are you so overwhelmed by the by the need that shows up that you can't even think or don't even want to put the word? in? that's my question. <laughs> we're we're a community, and I feel that as a community, we are responsible. Just like what you're saying, you have the information. And so you tell your neighbor about it and then it just keeps growing and growing. And that's how I've been noticing the word has gotten around because the unsheltered have their own community and they get the word to the others and they bring people in. They'll find one center, they may prefer it over the other one. We may have started out with seven and then next thing you know, we have 47 people at one center because of the word of mouth. And that's how a lot of the information has been getting out from people utilizing the centers. And just like the people that's volunteering, they'll go back to their church and say, hey, why can't we participate as a cooling center? So the responsibility relies on the community. And that's why we're here as a community. Everybody in this meeting should have a responsibility to put the word out in the community you see someone that's suffering, say, hey, come over here. And that's the meeting that we had last Friday where we had police officer representative there. 
And just by talking to them, they're going to go back. She come in there to get the information to be able to spread it to the police officers. When they see someone, don't arrest them and they'll bring them to the center. So they want to know where the cooling centers are and they're going to direct the people to the cooling centers. So this is an open discussion and we keep growing every year. We're learning as we go and improving as we go. But each member that's on this page right now has a responsibility to spread the word and get involved. But I think that you bring up an excellent point, Sherry, because there's many different avenues to contact people and you're bringing up what we call the last mile problem that how do we get people that are not sitting in their home on their computer trying to figure this out or trying to assist other people? And I have to tell you that AFN has done a heroic job of printing up business cards and going out into the community. Um, we have people from Phoenix Outreach that go out into the community with printouts of where the uh, cooling centers are. You saw AZ Hugs and Austin, who actually goes out into the community to find people who may be struggling. So we're trying to approach this from all angles, not just from, let's say, the public health department putting out the fact that cooling centers are now open. So it's an all hands on deck situation. Yeah, it's a, and, and to echo, um, I love your comment, Reverend Kate, in the chat about having signs up at parks and where people gather. I think every year we're trying to get more and more information out. Um, <clears throat> I have the dreams of the, um, oh my gosh, the not the bulletin boards. What am I thinking, you guys? The, the way signs. Someone unmute themselves. I know you all know what I'm Billboards, thank you. Oh. <laughs> like, that, that word, billboards. Um, billboards having information on there with at least the, the website uh, and, and or where folks could go. Um, but also the we've had a great partnership with Air, um, Arizona Jews for Justice and their hugs program with Austin, um, where we've been able to bring him on to our team throughout the summer and working with them to do street outreach. So he does uh, his mobile cooling van driving around to parks and seeing where they're congregated and letting them know about the cooling centers. Uh, we kind of start at our center and then um, wherever it is located in the valley and then work out around those neighborhoods with encampments and anyone else we see in the street. That's not saying we're capturing everyone by any means. Um, every summer, all of our workers and volunteers and myself go out and hand out flyers um, to anybody we see walking around and pass out water with that. Um, and I encourage all of you all, we'll have a packing night again this summer. Last summer, we um, did a huge packing night. It was a ton of fun. We packed a thousand heat relief bags within 45 minutes. Um, it was outstanding. And I didn't know what to do with everyone because we were done so quick. But um, we print out those little business cards Melissa was talking about for areas to say, here's these sites. Um, within this particular area of the town and to hand those out. But every year it's getting stronger and stronger. And um, so all of these questions, ideas um, are great. Definitely feel free to email them to us so that we can um, put them in our folders and keep saving them as we get more resources. We do more every year. We're with, over at Wesley at our food distribution that's going on every single week. I know we campaign for the cooling center. I, I spend all day, all distribution time telling them, oh, our cooling center is going to be opening up May 15th or whatever the date may be. But even when we didn't have a date, we were still telling them, hey, during the summer, we'll be open. During the summer, we'll be open. So um, the word does get, get around. And then if you have these faith-based organizations, um, nonprofit organizations, some of even the bigger guys that provide continuous services on a daily basis, they um, hopefully are spreading the word as well. But I know we are, you know, I, there's, there's not a, a Friday where we can't, where, where we're out there and we're giving out our food bags and everything where we're not mentioning it because the summer is catching up on us quickly. And some of the days of distribution are hot themselves, you know? So just like Friday, I was out and I'm like, man, guys, we getting ready for this cooling center to be open. It's a hot day today, but you know, that's just, just setting an expectation or a tone that we've got things coming, you know, not just, not just this service, 
artists that we're offering today. So word of mouth, I mean, it really, it, it does justice when it comes to the community and how, how fast, you know, the word gets around because it's the same with the distribution itself. You know, you'll have, you'll have um, our repeat, our, our regulars that show up every week to get a, a food bag. And then you'll see how that same one that we see every Friday or whatever day it is, is with now three other people that we've never seen or, you know, or they're calling people. So the same instance that, you know, like Miss Irene was stressing, that is is all of a, is a duty, you know, it's kind of a civic duty for us all to be kind of spreading the word to campaign for it, just as we do any other services that we provide. Okay. These are such great questions and we are we are getting close to our time. I'm dropping in the chat just one more time if my computer works. Um, the link back to our network and please stay connected via our newsletter because we'll have weekly updates there as our map starts to go live. Our first um, cooling center, or I'm sorry, there's new terminology. Our first heat respite center this summer is opening on May 1st, and that's at Larkspur Christian Church in Glendale. Um, and then Glendale Mission and Ministry Center will be opening um, within probably May 3rd. We're just waiting for the floor to get finished there. Um, and then Wesley, we will start opening as soon as possible. I believe right now that's set for May 15th. Um, and of course, we'll make some adjustments as as things um, begin to get hot there. And then we'll have many more sites opening throughout the summer. We would love to talk to you and are interested in getting your faith community involved in this, um, or if you have any ideas, we would love for you to volunteer, for you to come back out for our packing night. Um, stay tuned for that date. It will be coming up in the next month, I, I promise. And we'll have a couple of those throughout the summer too. Um, and get involved. If, if, it's, if this is something you want to do and get your faith community involved in, but you think it may not happen this summer, I really suggest you volunteer this summer, kind of see what's going on so you can um, tell your faith leaders firsthand this is what, what's going on. And um, Irene and I have a whole presentation we give to boards all the time, so we're happy to do that as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so we have some amazing staff on here too, just to give a quick shout out um, beyond our, our staff that we have <laughs> year round here at AFN um, with Vasu and Irene and Ellie who are on here. We have some more folks that are going to be working with us this summer in our cooling center, including Z. Um, and who else do we have on here? I'm seeing more folks. Do you guys want to turn on your cameras if you're working at a cooling center this summer and just give us a quick wave. Uh, Nadia is going to be our first church lead. Z's over at Wesley. Yes. Romero, good to see you. I don't, we, we're still in the midst of assigning you, so just wait. <laughs> I don't know if Irene's assigned you yet, so we have great plans uh, this summer. So lots and lots of folks. So Eugene's on here too, I'm seeing, and probably some folks that I'm missing. So apologies if I did, Ginger. Um, everyone else, we are bringing on 18 staff this summer to work at our cooling centers and respite centers. And I have to share that like we had more than 18 applicants, which is really exciting. And they all came in within the last week. Um, and so please give Irene a lot of prayers as she gets everyone on board <laughs> and trained. And I'm helping with her too. And so are the rest of us that have done this before. But we um, are just so grateful for your time. And oh, good, good, good. More folks in there. Kate, Reverend Kate. How, how uh, healthy are our food banks this year? I know we um, in Glendale do a lot of uh, getting of uh, food from the Northwest Food Bank. And of course, during COVID and when uh, prices started to get so high, the there was as much or more need, but the opportunities were less. So how are they doing this year? Z, you want to come in on that? They got quite skimpy, and then we had to um, we had a donation coming in from the um, Hemp Foundation 
to kind of um, pick up on the bags, but they had, they were, it was decreasing. We started off pretty good and then it went down, but. <sighs> so yeah, it's, it's been affected. But it doesn't stop the people, they still come. So we yes. like um, <laughs> in the month of March, we had five weeks, we service 2,339 individuals mm -hmm. in the month of March to be such a small facility. So it's a great need. Well, yeah. we uh, also shop at Smart and Final a lot in Costco to get things when we can't get them from the food bank. Um, even Fry's has some great bargains occasionally, but, um, you know, especially things that you want to get in bulk, like maybe cereals for the food bags or, or granola bars or something like that, um, it helps to have those available. Reverend King, one time it was so skimpy, I had to run to the dollar store. <laughs> I felt so bad. I was like, this is so skimpy. So yeah, it's it's bad. Yeah, it's um, it's been it's been tough, but um, we are working hand in hand with the Arizona Food Bank Network to continue <laughs> to get the resources out there that we need. Um, and so again, we would love donations, volunteers water 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 you can always use that um and please stay in touch with us as it continues to get hot we'll definitely make more times for more information and gathering to share um again so we are so great we are right on time so i'm going to stop us here i want to say dog and cat food too yes dog oh, and cat food that, yes bring it absolutely in. absolutely Thank you all so much for your time. Um, we will be following up with the recording of this and shorter presentations so you can share and share out and get the message out. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful day and blessings. Bless you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.